Hello Tech Pros, episode 246. You know, people will follow you and you'll set the tone for how fast people work, how hard they work, the culture of the company. So it's all about, it is all about your leadership. Welcome to the podcast where we explore the opportunities, challenges, and anxieties that technical professionals and techpreneurs face when building their career, building their products, and building their business. This show is about the people behind technology and the mindsets and skill sets that they developed that led to their success. You can learn more about this podcast and our guests at hellotechpros.com and about overcoming social anxiety at anxietynerd.com. All right, let's get started. Hello, Tech Pros. This is Chad Bostic, and I'm excited to introduce our featured guest today, Darren Whitaker Barnett. Happy Saturday, G'day. Darren. Happy Saturday, Chad. Good day. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Are you ready to hustle? Absolutely ready to rock it. Awesome. Who's on Location founder and CEO, Darren Whitaker Barnett, believes that the safety and security of people, assets, and IP starts with knowing who is on site. Their SaaS app, Who's on Location, makes managing the presence of people easy and verifying their safety in the event of an ev- evacuation hassle-free. Darren, I love this the premise of the software. I used to work in a Fortune 100 company uh, in uh, in the corporate headquarters of an oil and gas company, and it was you know a big tower. There were about three thousand employees that worked in just this one location, and then we had gosh, I don't know, hundreds of other locations from big offices with a few hundred people to small field sites with just three or four people in them and managing all of that it wasn't my responsibility but i i was you know part of the it team who helped kind of uh keep those systems in place it it could have been a nightmare in certain circumstances because uh, at any point in time you know you've got visitors coming in you've got travelers coming in uh you've got employees out you know on vacation or out sick for the day you've got other people leaving for meetings and going to lunch and there's so many people just coming in and out of the different buildings and the different locations I can see where this is a huge industry and a, a huge potential for you guys to rock and roll. Um, but first, I wanted to just start with like, uh, what does entrepreneurship mean to you specifically? Well, to me, it's about uh, it's about being able to adapt and, uh, and and adapt to change really quickly. I mean, entrepreneurship is about creating things, right? And I always use the analogy of Charles Darwin. And he was stating that all species of organisms arise and develop through the natural selection of small inherited variations that increase the individual's ability to compete, survive, and produce. And to me, entrepreneurship or entrepreneurs are people that are stepping into the path of an industry or sector's evolution and changing its direction to another route. And if we take a look at what's happening in the world with things like Google, you know, they started off as a search engine and now they're morphing into a whole range of other areas we don't need to sort of educate the audience on those but everything from driverless cars through to you know uh just you know you look guys like elon musk that are that are changing the direction of space travel and making it open and and available to the general public uh you know to me it's really about uh evolutionary change and uh the the speed of your ability to adapt man I, i love it it's all about failing fast and and moving forward quickly Um, Can you take us back before who's on location? So what's the backstory of Darren? What's the backstory of yourself? Like, where did this idea of who's on location come from? Oh, absolutely. Great question. Uh, You know, every entrepreneur has a, every startup guy or lady has a, has a backstory, right? And, and mine comes from a strong sales and marketing background. Uh, my One of my first, I guess, growing up jobs was working for an Australian company called Recall. Fantastic company. We did information management, but it was old school information management when I was there. You know, we looked after boxes of data, boxes of information, and we sent that back a little bit, uh, you know, a, a little bit old when, you, when I look back in time. Uh, from there, I went on to Coca-Cola. And uh, at Coca-Cola, my job was to, to, to grow the business against Pepsi uh, in the Australasian market and predominantly, obviously, New Zealand, where I'm from. Uh, from there, went on to Transalta. Transalta was a, a derig- uh, power company actually out of Canada that came down to New Zealand. We were one of the first countries to deregulate the energy industry uh, in the world. And uh, the Canadian company Transalta came down our way, purchased a couple of local companies so they could learn about deregulation and operating in that environment. Uh, so they could take that learning back to the Canadian market when they deregulated. So that gave me an opportunity to, uh, to learn some different skill sets and uh, particularly learned to work with engineers, and uh, which is pretty much my day job when I was there, but also managing you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of accounts. Uh, 
my backstory continues. I went on to uh, to actually win New Zealand Salesperson of the Year, so I had a really strong sales and marketing background, as I stated earlier. And uh, armed with that um, with that award, I was you know I was in the media a little bit. I was in the news. I was on TV. It sort of gave me the confidence that. Uh, I could do something that I've always wanted to do, which was to get into the tech industry. But I'm not a coder, so I'm not one of your entrepreneurial Saturday morning hookups that uh, that come from a, a coding background. I actually don't know how to write one line of code. But I joined a US company called Computer Associates, and they introduced me to to selling in the, in the tech space and uh, putting me through some pretty rigorous programs, really tough company to work for, really tough KPIs, but a great learning experience. Uh, effectively, uh, from there, I actually went back after a successful tenure there, I went back to uh, the deregulated energy industry and worked for a local company called Meridian, the largest hydro generator and green energy platform uh, in Australasia, in fact, one of the largest in the world. And uh, I sort of got to a stage where at one point after several years there, I realized that I'd sold over a billion dollars worth wow. of sales for the companies that I'd represented. And I thought, I should be doing this for myself. I've, I've got all the confidence. I've got the corporate and the sort of the startup mentality behind me. But you spend, I guess, a lot of founders that are listening today or a lot of people that are looking to get into business today, they ask themselves, well, what am I going to do? And I was sort of stuck in that dilemma. I had the energy. I had the passion. I had the drive. I felt that I had the skill set. I just didn't have the thing that was going to, mm-hmm. you know, that, uh, that, that silver cloud moment, that lightning bulb moment, sorry. Um, one day, I, and then the company that I was working for, in, uh, in Wellington, New Zealand, our capital city here, we were evacuated from our building. And when the first responders turned up, they chastised our health and safety manager, gave him a bit of a curry up, so to speak. And I asked uh, him afterwards, I said, what was going on there? I said, oh, a couple of our staff were doing heavy project work for our CEO. They refused to come downstairs during the evacuation because they knew it was a fire alarm test. It wasn't real. And we also left the visitor book upstairs. So, cut a long story short, we weren't able to validate or verify the safety of the people that we were responsible for, and the first responders weren't happy about that. So, that was the genesis moment for me. That was, there must be a better way to account for people in the event of an emergency when they need to be accounted for at the most crucial time. And so, that started off me thinking, I went on another year and a half, two-year journey where I spent every moment of my spare time after hours and on weekends researching what I call the people presence management space looking for how are these problems solved today. And largely, they weren't being solved. I couldn't find anything in the world that was solving them. And uh, so that was the beginning of the journey for who's on location. Man, that's fantastic. It's, it's, I'm, I'm so happy that this story started with a test of an emergency situation and not an actual emergency because far too many times in situations like this, I hear just on the news or other startup stories where the impetus or the idea came from an actual emergency, something horrible happened and, you know, lives were lost or, or files were destroyed or, you know, what have you, property was destroyed. And then it was like, oh my gosh, we needed to have something in place before this ever happens again. We need to, you know, build ourselves some insurance in this case. So I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled that you saw the opportunity just from a test, just from a fire drill test. We're like, you know what? We didn't get everyone out of the building. We didn't account for all of the people. It was not the most safe example. And there's got to be a potential solution. There's got to be a better way. Oh, absolutely. And one of the things that we face quite regularly is people will say to us, uh, you know, if we ever get into a, like a situation where we get to present to a larger management team, uh, we're a cloud-based app, so we very seldom have to do that. But 1% of our client base, they still want to do the full, you know, the traditional client server, RFP process, et cetera. And we go down that path, particularly for the larger organizations. And one of the comebacks, one of the pushbacks we might get on the evacuation story that we tell is, well, we have a floor clearance policy. So when the floor is cleared, we know that everybody's out of the building. The reality is, is that always works in a fire alarm test. But does it work when half the building collapsed? Does it Mm. work when your fire marshal or your fire warden was away on leave? It it actually doesn't work. And unfortunately, here in New Zealand, we've had, you know, some bitter experience of that uh, with with a major earthquake several years back in Christchurch. Uh, but of course, there's fires and there's uh, there's shooters on sites, and you know the, the U.S. Uh, you know community is well aware of what happens in those environments where you can't account for people, people are hiding. Uh, so how how do you manage that? And so that's that's what effectively what Who's on Location does. We're we're helping organisations verify the safety of people in the event of an emergency. We can't guarantee their safety, but we can help you verify whether they're in or out. 
Okay, so how do you track? So we're technology nerds here on Hello Tech Pros, and there's a lot of people going like, how are you tracking them? Are there RFID tags in everybody's shoes, and you're like literally scanning them when they're walking in and out of the building, or does it require a person to push a button or to scan a badge? Like, how does it work to track an individual asset or an individual person on a location? Oh, again, another great question. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing that we have to uh, we have to revolve right, which is one of the things I led in with earlier. So when we started off, we said, well, let's let's just well, what I thought I'd do first was let me just start with small steps. Let me get my first viable product, my minimum viable product up. You know, a bit of a cliche, but let's do that. And that was mm-hmm. let's replace the visitor book. So we just created a cloud-based visitor management system to be fair a little bit of a me too product that particular element of it uh today there's quite a number of competitors out there doing that and visitors so we thought well let's just track visitors come on coming on site so they sign into a kiosk kiosk can be an ipad or windows based device etc and they sign themselves in so we started off with that then we decided that okay we're now ready to start differentiating between the different classes of visitors that come on site particularly contractors so when a contractor comes on site we want to recognize them as being validated authenticated they have their insurances in place they're allowed to be on site so how how I talk about the darwin theory and how we have to adapt is the point of difference we first introduced was hey let's create a different workflow so that contractors can be treated a different way and recognized a different way but the outcome is at the end of the day one system knows which visitors are on site and which contractors are on site. And they were just signing in through a kiosk. We then went to a sort of our third evolutionary sort of change was when companies came to us and said, hey, you know, you're looking after visitors and contractors. How about you help track our employees? And we first thing I thought of was Big Brother. When I worked for Computer Associates, we tried introducing um, – uh, bio into biometrics into some of the government departments and whilst it was very efficient and a great productivity saver uh, at the end of the you know, for signing on to your SSO etc at the end of the day it didn't get buy-in so I knew that we were too early for biometrics going back in 2012 so we basically asked staff members to sign in on their PC to register their sorry yeah to, to their employees to register their presence on their own PC but what's happened uh, Chad is that you know different companies have different cultures Uh, around the world not just within company to company everybody wants to we've got too much to do we're signing into too many things so what we've done to address that problem was we've said well what if we gave you a platform that allowed people to sign in with their smartphone on their pc on a kiosk integration through access control which is like a no touch policy where you don't do anything different you just swipe your card to walk in the door and we'll pick it up through the access control system and tag you on site so we've found a way to basically take away the barriers to entry of being able to track everybody and every person class coming onto a site by just introducing that innovation uh, into the product. So it sounds like you're really giving the employees, the the people on the site, as well as each company, kind of the options available to how do they want to manage their people or how do the individuals want to manage themselves, right? Do I want to sign in via kiosk? Do I want to go to my desk? Do I want to just install the application on my mobile device? And that way, people kind of have the freedom to to use whatever means makes the most sense in their particular case. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... You know, getting getting employees, getting five thousand employees at uh, you know a large corporate site to suddenly have to do something extra to sign in and register their presence on site. It's it might be the it might be something that your IT manager, your security manager, your facilities manager, uh, or health and safety manager wants to actually do, and they're mandated to do it because of compliance. Uh, you know, in most Western jurisdictions in the world, the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, most of us sort of have an English common law background to, a, to our judicial process and law. And almost without exception, we do tend to follow each other. And one of the one of the practices now, or one of the regulations in most countries, is that you must be able to account for people in the event of an emergency. But it's it's, it's uh, implied; it's not explicit. So how you do that is how is the space that we're in. We're solving that by how by giving you tools to to manage that. So what's the what's the timeline been here for who's on location? When did you guys really start that MVP? And uh, was that back in the 2012 area? Yeah, it was. Well, actually, we actually started a couple of years before that, but I had a mm-hmm. full-time job. So we were, we were a classic, you know, I wouldn't say working out of a garage, but uh, on Sundays, mm-hmm. I went down, I did my accounting or my my, my code designs uh, with a friend, uh, my GUI, sorry, with, uh, again, with no background in the space whatsoever, just hacked it out, believe it or not, Chad, 
Microsoft Paint and PowerPoint. How would the screens it. look? How would the screens look? What would they do? In 2010, we actually had no reference point, right? So there wasn't that many cloud apps out there that that were B to B. You know, the, uh, the a lot of them were you know social media applications, and the B two Bs had sort of died like five or six years earlier in the in the dot com crash. So there wasn't a lot of great reference points. So we were sort of starting as I wouldn't say pioneers, but we we're effectively sort of pioneering the way some of the applications could work. We did have the benefit uh, of uh, an industry leader uh, in cloud um, solutions here in New Zealand, which was Zero, had just started out several years earlier. And so they gave you some insights and you went along to their workshops to how to build great code and how to how to you know how to how to maximize uh, UI experiences. So mm-hmm. effectively, look, we started in 2010 with a with a sort of a beta product, and we shared that with a with a government department. Actually, I mean, it's a bit of a story we don't necessarily want to shout about, but you know, <laughs> here we are doing it. We actually were a cloud based company working out of our house, and uh, my developer <laughs> and I sold it into a government department, and uh, and we basically didn't do anything else. We just sort of let them play with it for like a year or two, and uh, about about eighteen months. And in two thousand and twelve, you know, uh, got some early money on board from friends and family, and we decided that we had a commercially viable product just based on one one insight. Uh, one install, so to speak, and, and we went from there. And it's just been, we're now in 23 countries in terms of our customer base. We're managing thousands of organizational sites across North America, Europe, Australasia, New Zealand, the Pacific Islands. And uh, it's been a real ride. I love that story, Darian, because you, you know, you, you admittedly don't come from a technology, meaning a hands-on technical role, but you understand the technology enough where uh, the lack of not knowing how to code is not going to stop you from building your business. You're like, hey, there is a gap in the marketplace and there's a need, right? So I'm going to design the user interface. I'm going to design how it should work. And I'm going to find somebody else, a technical expert, uh, a coder to come in and do the nuts and bolts and pull things together to make it happen. And then after that point, you have a minimal viable product that then you sold to a government agency just out of your garage, you got a cloud-based application that you guys built basically from your garage and now turn that into uh, a big business now. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, we pinch ourselves sometimes to realize where we came from. Uh, of course, the world's a lot more sophisticated now. You, know, you have your, your PWCs and your Deloitte's and your, and your big accounting firms that are in the consultancy space. And they're now, you know, the, the cloud-based SaaS, SaaS world is growing up and now there's a whole lot of... Uh, you know, ISO and, and Sarbanes-Oxley and HIPPA, you know, compliances that you've got to get to. You've got to get right. to FedRAMP approval to sell into the U.S. market, et cetera. So it's really growing up. The days of being able to probably pull that off with the government department are long gone. <laughs> um, but it was probably the the absence of sophistication and understanding in cloud that got us through that first door. But, hey, you know, uh, you would have heard this many times before. You know, you've got your know, Sometimes your success comes down to luck, but you've got to create your own luck, and uh, and then you've got to ride that. And at some time, at some stage, your luck will run out, and you've got to be real, and and that's where we're at. In the early days, what were the biggest challenges that you had to overcome in order to get that first client or to get that MVP to actually work? So the primary challenge we had was being a cloud-based product and pretty much one of the, not the first, but certainly one of the first uh, in our local market here in New Zealand and obviously selling into government. So how do we do that? So effectively what we did, and I'm sure this is a, a common story, was we gave it to them for free. We said, look, what do you got to lose? We provided the hardware, we provided the internet, the uh, the, the training, and we basically did uh, – you know, we, we, we built the product based on customer feedback. So at that point in time, that particular customer, and I can only speak from our experience, they, they had nothing. They just had a book that you signed into. You know, visitors were signing in illegibly. And we basically went to their office management team. We said, hey, how much time do you spend chasing employees to, to let them know their visitors arrived? Because don't forget, the minimum viable product had nothing to do with what we do today. It was just a visitor book on an iPad, right? You know, it was just a... Right. It was just a basic app. So they said, oh, we spend X amount of hours doing it. And and uh, we worked out how much time we would spend. I said, well, look, if I could give you an app that basically the visitor signs in, they get to read the evacuation report and the and the visitor process for signing in, they sign in. And then uh, your employee automatically gets notified via email and text message. Wouldn't that be cool? They said, that'd be fantastic. So that's we basically got it in by just having a, a good conversation about a problem that actually didn't exist. Remember the when we started, the customers didn't see they had a problem. So that was quite a difficult thing to overcome, that you were basically introducing something that they felt they didn't need, but you were showing them a the benefit of doing it. And then we said, we're not even going to charge you. We're just going to let you use the product. We didn't tell them they were the only client. 
they gave us a whole lot of feedback over the next sort of year to 18 months, which is a long time, right, to basically have a product sitting there mm-hmm. with only one customer. But, you know, I knew that we had to really understand the business pain and understand, you know, the scope of where we needed to go with the product before we could, you know, charge them something that we felt was going to be commercially viable and stand the test of, stand the test of time so that we'd, you know, in the long run, would be a sustainable company. And that's the process we took. Um you know, a little story that I, I do share with some people is that uh, I'm actually sharing it with a worldwide audience today is, you know, so how did we get our second client? Well, we went up after another government department and uh, they asked us how we, uh, do we have any reference sites? And we said, look, we, you know, we, we have one reference site that's prepared to share, but most of our customers, uh, you know, we keep it confidential because of what we do. And and then we got our second. And so you just got to have the kahunas, I guess, to, to just keep on pushing through and that's what I tell every entrepreneur is that you're going to go over, you're going to have to overcome barriers that uh, the big players in the market don't have to overcome because of their reputation. You're just going to find a way, always find a way. That's amazing. I, I love I love that advice because I do not come from a marketing background. I do not come from a sales background. I'm really, really new in that area, but I do come from a high technical background. And so um, just recently, you know, getting into sales, getting into marketing, you know, studying the craft and a lot of advice that I've heard and read and and uh, seen recently is, you know, don't go into markets where you have to explain to your customers that they have a problem. You need to go into markets when you're first starting out with customers dying, dying to solve this problem. And they're, they're, they've got massive, massive, you know, neck bleeding, as they call it, right? They're, they're bleeding at the neck and they desperately need a solution and more importantly, need the right solution and more importantly, need your solution. And I love the fact that you're like, no, forget all that. You have a problem. You don't know you have a problem, but I can make your life better. Can you uh, can you see that this would be a, a, a great thing to have? And they're like, yeah, sure, man. That, that would be awesome. You know what? That is kind of a pain in the neck. It Maybe I'm not bleeding at the neck, but it's kind of a pain. And yeah, sure, I'll, I'll give it a try. Well, absolutely. I mean, if, if you know, Dara, you know, if we look at the late Steve Jobs, wonderful man, fantastic entrepreneur, highly driven individual. If he, did anyone say to him, that we needed the iPod. <laughs> no, we had sir. the Walkman. Did, did anyone? Did any customers line up and send them emails saying, "Hey, can you can you create the iPhone for me?" No right. one did that, right? So he said, "I think there's a problem there," and the problem is ABC. You know, better communication through a mobile device with with uh, with, uh, with rich data and you know and whatever he saw in the future, he said, "I'm going to bring that to the market and I'm going to show you that you think you don't have a problem." But you got a problem, and you got a problem when you see what I've got, to, what I'm going to deliver you. And uh, there's lots of evidence of that. I, I understand that uh, you know in most situations you've got to go down that path where you, you've got to identify the problem. The customer has to resonate with that, and then you you go and fill that gap. Um, but at the same time, most if you really look at a lot of the great innovations of the world, really look at look at them deeply, deeply, they were bought to market. You know. Uh, without that validation, the entrepreneurs just led from the front foot and said, "I'm going to solve a problem that you think you don't have," um, and that's sort of a. I'm not saying that's something I would advocate. It's just something that I did, and uh, that's that's the way we went. And it's come with its challenges. And uh, of course, you talk about luck and timing. Of course, what's happened since 2012 is that the world has become a more insecure place. You know, we uh, we have we uh, you know, don't want to talk about it too much, but we have a lot more terrorism. We have. We have shooters on site into different buildings. We have a lot of disconnect between rich and poor. Uh, we have a lot of intellectual property theft through cybercrime, et cetera. You know, and we look at, um, you know, I, I read a lot of reports and I look at, say, the markets to markets report uh, said that in the facilities management industry is worth over, uh, you know, is estimated to grow from $28.9 billion this year to $56 billion in 2021. So there's going to be $56 billion spent on facilities management. And this is just in the U.S., um, on securing facilities, managing facilities. You then look at Gartner reports, uh, the 2016 IT spending report, where they say there's, you know, the uh, IT spending is going to be projected to be 2.77 trillion for worldwide IT security. Uh, um, and and you think about that, and then you think about you know what's happening in cyber security, and then non-tech security. A report that I saw going way back in 2013 from. Um, ASIS and the Institute of Finance and Management was that uh, the United States security industry in 2013, uh, sorry, stated the market size was 350 billion for for operational non-IT security spending. So you look at all this, all the money going into security and protecting assets, IP, people safety, and it's just coming together at this particular point in time where 
you know, that, I guess that's where the luck comes in for us. We started out a little bit earlier than most, and now we're in a space where our growth is exponential and the market opportunity is great, um, and it's based around, uh, yeah, pro- providing security and safety for people. So, Darren, speaking of the security and safety of people, I want to really touch on that in just a moment and go into, you know, what we can do as entrepreneurs or what we can do as, you know, business owners or just employees of other people when we're going to work, when we're going home, the things that we're doing to make sure that we are safe and make sure that our colleagues are safe. We'll touch on that in just a moment. But first, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsors. This episode of Hello Tech Pros is sponsored by you, the audience. Instead of looking for new corporate sponsors, I've decided to adopt a pay-per-value model. What that means is you decide on how much I get paid. If you're just browsing and have yet to get value out of the show, don't feel obligated to pay a darn thing. However, if this podcast does its intended job of helping you build your career, build your products, or build your business, consider becoming a sponsor on Patreon. Pick the level of recurring donation that matches the level of value you get out of this show or make a one-time sponsorship for that big aha moment that have helped turn things around for you. Become a sponsor today at patreon.com slash hellotechpros or visit hellotechpros.com slash sponsor. Okay, we're back with Darren Whitaker Barnett. Darren is the CEO and founder of Who's On Location, a SaaS application that makes managing the presence of people easy and verifying their safety in the event of evacuation hassle-free. We've been talking to Darren about you know, the startup journey that he's had both as an, an employee of other companies as well as, you know, um, just really getting the idea, where did the idea for who's on location came from? It came from a test, a test of a uh, fire alarm uh, evacuation that, you know what, we didn't have all the paperwork. We couldn't account for all the people in the location. And that can be a scary, scary really, really big problem. And when you're thinking about lives are at stake in an emergency situation, if it hadn't been a test, if it had been a real fire or an earthquake or a shooter on site and so forth. So, you know, Darren, you work with a lot of different companies who have seen various problems across, you know, uh, across the spectrum here. What can we do as individuals to really think about safety first when we're going into work and when we're on the job, you know, regardless of what system or uh, software is in place, but really think about how we can make our work areas much safer? So it really varies from environment to environment. And, you know, in, in in a benign environment like the office environment, if you're a corporate worker, you know, most people would recognize or probably say to themselves, there's not really a lot of threat. There's not really a lot of hazards there. So it really comes down to, in a corporate environment, just being aware that you, uh, that, uh, you know, of potential threats, most of the threats that would come in a corporate environment would tend to be, you know, from, uh, you know, some of the examples that we have had is, is threats to theft of property, you know, so like stair walkers and what have you. And so it's just being aware of, you know, do you know what I mean by stair walkers, Chad? No, sir, I'm not. What is that? So the people, well, basically, you know, there's the there's a worldwide phenomenon of people walking into buildings and and posing as staff, and basically, they, the theory of walking through the stairs is basically they're walking through the different floors that are unchallenged, and so the so the challenge for the for the employee of that organisation is to have the awareness or have the, the 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 confidence that they can challenge people who they don't know uh, why are they in their building. That's pretty much one of the biggest threats, uh, in the sense that you know you can dress up these days in a you know, in a, in a uniform that makes you look like a contractor and you can just be walking through the building unchallenged. And it's one of the biggest threats that uh, that people see and that's why a lot of people are using our product. They want to be able to identify and differentiate between employees and visitors. But one of the more aggressive environments in terms of employee awareness of hazards and safety and health, they tend to come in the more in the manufacturing industry, uh, construction sites. You talked about the oil industry when we first started this conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so utilities, there's a lot of hazards on site and it's really about being aware so it's awareness of hazards acknowledging those hazards and making sure that you have put steps in place to mitigate those hazards and bring them to the attention of colleagues that are unaware of them and uh, and one of the things that we do we do that through the app so people can register the hazards and they can bring them to the awareness and attention of visitors and contractors and other employees Um, some of the other experiences that we've had you know is we have a lot of remote workers so you think about social welfare workers um nurses, uh, anybody that's going away from the workplace, but they're still engaged in their work. So therefore, they still the employer still has a, re- a degree of responsibility for that employee. 
then how is that safety? How is their safety and security being managed? And so that's where there's a lot of ways that you can do this. There's geo-tracking, as you're aware. There's lots, so many geo-tracking apps out there where the employee can keep tabs on where their employee is. There's man down type products where, mm-hmm. you know, if it, there's, there's, it's, it's all, there's almost a plethora of those. And so responsibility for, for your safety, I know legally it sits with your employer, but really it starts with yourself. At the end of the day, you've got to be aware of what's going on because your employer can't make you not fall in a hole. Right. So what they have to do, of course, is put up a hazard notice. You've got to make sure that you read it and stay aware of it. Awesome. Great stuff. There's there's so many, so many potential hazards out there that I think, you know, you called it. You just got to be aware, be aware of your surroundings, be aware of the um, what's normal in your environment. Right. And if normal in your environment is having a lot of uh, strange people in, in jumpsuits kind of coming in and out all day because there's a lot of work going on. Okay, that's normal for now. But if it's not normal, like if you're if you're uh, walking down the hall and you see somebody that doesn't look like they belong there, you know, like you said, you got to be brave enough to call them out. Say hi. You know, you don't have to be a jerk about it. Just say, hey, how's it going? My name's Chad. Like, who are you? Who do you work for? What are you doing here? And uh, it, that's a big part of it, man. That social engineering can potentially be horrible because, as you said, people can just, you know, if they're crooks, if they're criminals, if they're just uh, whatever, they're just there not for work purposes. Um, it, they can they can put everybody potentially at risk, you know, or property or intellectual property at risk. So just be aware of what's going on. Oh, absolutely. You, know, you, you think about most most tech companies, right, have a clear desk policy. In fact, most corporates mm-hmm. would have, I'm not saying they necessarily practice it, but most of them have a clear desk policy. They have access control. Uh, visitors are identified with, uh, you know, with time expiring badges or, or just plain badges, um, lanyards with visitor cards on them. Uh, you can have all those things in place, but, you, but it all falls down if you don't know who's on site and you, and you don't challenge them if you, if you feel that you have to. So not in the game of uh, actually selling fear, uh, but the reality is, is that uh, you're there to protect your people, and, uh, and that's what we're there to do, to help do. Awesome. Darren, do you have any final words of wisdom for our audience on either entrepreneurship or safety? And then please share the best way that we can connect with you, and then we'll say goodbye. Absolutely. So the, um, one of the things that I should, just in terms of words of wisdom, uh, you know, a couple of quotes here. The first one, the speed of leader, the speed of the leader determines the speed of the gang. So one of the things I'd say to entrepreneurs is that, you know, people will follow you and you'll set the tone for how fast people work, how hard they work, the culture of the company. So it's all about, it is all about your leadership. The second one is successful business people share the ability to hire people smarter than they are. That's a really common trait, and I'm sure that's been across a number of podcasts that you've done in the past, but you've got to be able to employ people that are that are better than you at the things that you don't do. And I've learned that, uh, I'm going to admit that, I learned that the hard way. We, we really didn't hire. We, we wasted a lot of time, probably lost a year by just trying to do it all ourselves. The other one was capital can do nothing without brains to direct it. So if you're going to be raising capital, money helps you only so far. You come to a point, uh, an inflection point, where you need to get more on board than just capital. And so where you can, always try and get that smart money. The other thing that I would say is if there was, if I give some tip, anyone, I'd really recommend you read a book called Outliers by Malcolm Coldwell. Have you read that, uh, Chad? No, I haven't. So Outliers by Malcolm Coldwell. Uh, it's a fantastic book and it's, and it supports his thesis that he examines the causes of why the majority of Canadian ice hockey players are born in the first few months of the calendar year. Hmm. And it also looks at things like how Microsoft co-founder Bill Bates achieved his extreme wealth, how the Beatles became one of the most successful musical acts in human history. And there's a, a whole bunch of anecdotal, uh, fantastic storytelling, but it really enlightens you as an entrepreneur. If you take a look at that book, it's a little bit left field, but I'd really encourage that. Um, Look, in terms, of, uh, in terms of contacting us, uh, check out our website. It's whosonlocation.com. Uh, my my uh, Twitter handle is DWB on location. My, cus- my company is uh, company Twitter is who's on location. And uh, you can also track us down and keep, keep in touch with us at LinkedIn. And it literally is just uh, Darren Wittaker Barnett will search for who's on location and you've got to grab hold of us. Well, Darren, thank you so much for joining me on Hello Tech Pros today. I really value this conversation, not just about entrepreneurship, but about safety. 
you know, um, we, in my opinion, it's it's exactly what you said. We're not selling fear here, but it is a scary world. There's a lot of stuff going on, and we need to be aware. So if we could just every now and then, every few months, once a quarter, kind of talk about this amongst ourselves, amongst our colleagues, amongst our, the management team, and just say, hey, what are we doing to make sure that everybody's going to go home safely at night? Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. We all, whether we have uh, family or friends or hobbies, whatever we want to do, we want to go home with ten fingers, ten hand, uh, ten fingers, ten toes, and uh, everything else in good condition. So, thanks for coming on the show and talking about that with us today. Thanks, Chad. I really appreciate the opportunity and safe travels over Christmas. You bet. This is this is the end of the year. Oh my gosh, this is the end of 2016 already. It feels like we just got out of September. It feels like we really just kind of started this year. I don't know how it happened, but I wish you all the very best. Happy holidays, no matter where you are. And uh, you've been listening to Darren Whitaker Barnett, and I'm Chad Bostic. And until next time, take care. The show notes page for this episode can be found at hellotechpros.com slash 246. Do you use Slack for team communication? Join the Hello Tech Pros Slack channel at hellotechpros.com slash Slack. If this episode helped you out in any way, please leave a review on iTunes and let me know what you thought iTunes reviews helps our rankings, which helps us grow the Hello Tech Pros podcast to a broader audience, which helps more technical professionals and techpreneurs build their career, build their products, and build their businesses. If you are a subscriber and get repeat value out of this show, consider becoming a sponsor on Patreon. The information on this podcast is free to everyone, but I'm giving you the opportunity to pay for the value you get out of it, starting as little as a dollar a month. Pledge your support today at patreon.com slash hellotechpros or visit hellotechpros.com slash sponsor.